Okay, it uh, looks like we're starting into our uh, live stream here, the Q&A session. Um, welcome back for those that uh, are joining us for this Q&A session. We do have all of our speakers available to answer questions that uh, weren't able to be asked during their presentations. I know a few of them were, were uh, uh, there are some extra questions out there, so we just want to open it up. Uh, it looks like we have a question that's come in already uh, from Jason Mellon. Uh, question for Dr. Lesnick, what general algorithms are you using for your model, neural networks and or others? Yeah, so I'm using a specific type of neural network called uh, gated recurrent units. So they're, they're called recurrent neural networks and I'm stacking a few of those in layers with a few, few other layers for dropout features, convolution, stuff like that. So um, yeah, continuing to just play around with those, but they are neural networks, yes. Okay, great. Uh, other questions here, please uh, please type them in. Um, I do have some questions for Dr. Uh, Lee Lay on, on her presentation that we can ask, some that weren't asked at the time. Um, from Michelle, how sensitive is the process, I'm assuming this is the Animox process, uh, to influent flow variation? And what's the typical residence time of the process, both HRT and SRT? Um, so for side stream, which has been proven and successful, um, it is, well, I would say moderately sensitive to the influence characteristics, which is the centrate. So some things we learned is you want to uh, make sure you do not send in too much of the solids into the system. For example, if you have a, a upset in your dewatering process, the um, you would want to temporarily di uh, well, divert the, the feed to a, a small tank uh, so that your system won't be um, upset due to the incoming carbon in the solids, which encourages the, um, the hydrogels. Um, and other than that, um, as long as you implement a, a robust instrumentation system that uh, controls the process in the, in the range needed, the system is pretty steady. Uh, for the mainstream, uh, there's a still uh, current go, uh, ongoing effort to, to consistently activate the system uh, regarding how sensitive the, uh, it is to the influence characteristics going into the bioreactor. What we find is you want to, um, you want to uh, direct carbon off the bioreactor as much as uh, possible. So you don't encourage the hydrogel for denitrifiers going in to compete it. Um, and uh, there are, of course, uh, some sensitivity to the control parameters, such as uh, um, the DO level, the ammonia level, which you want to optimize to um, to switch more of the Animox or even nitrogen shortcut removal pathway. Um, so does that answer your question? Well, uh, while, we, while we wait for him to respond to that, um, uh, well, her actually to respond to that, that was from Michelle at King County. Uh, mm -hmm. Question for uh, Dr. Lesnick uh, from Jason Flowers. Do you have thoughts on how neural networks will produce guidance for operational improvements? Yeah, actually our idea is to move beyond uh, neural networks and use structural models. Uh, so directed, directed graph models uh, to, to break apart those neural networks. So actually figure out um, what is it interpreting? Um, and at that point we can say, it's predicting this big upset and key into a couple of features that that might actually be be the causes of this upset that is predicting, you know, a week in the future. And then from that, if we can build those structural models to do that, then we can say, well, maybe if we, you know, change this component over this next week, we'll see a decrease in that predicted upset. Um, 
but yeah, we need to move beyond neural networks and we need to break those apart to get to that, that point. Okay, thank you. Um, a question for Dr. Lay again uh, from Jason Flowers. How long does it take for an Animox system to recover from an upset considering the long doubling time of the Animox bacteria? Uh, that's a good question. For a commonly used configuration using granular sludge, um, so there is a consideration can be included in the design uh, to accommodate a uh, possible update during operation. For example, for Alex Renew, besides the two main reactor, we have a small daughter reactor. That's just a fraction of the uh, main reactor size, which is used to store some of the waste animox uh, biomass in that tank. So in case uh, upset occurs, so we can quickly uh, seed back. So the uh, to make the recover um, uh, speedier that way. Okay, thank you. Um, this question is for Dr. Chauvin um, from John Gasek. Uh, for very small wastewater systems, uh, simplicity in operations is best. What nutrient removal technologies are best suited for small systems to remove both nitrogen and phosphorus? So I, again, with, with the nutrient removal, the, the best system would be using A2O process with, with the oxidation ditch. That would be the most simpler system I have seen uh, that can be and, and again, um, it can be packaged or it can be uh, built in or constructed, but A2O does give uh, a pretty decent removal with respect to uh, nitrogen and phosphorus. Uh, but again, if the effluent limits are pretty low for phosphorus, they may have to add some tertiary uh, treatment or tertiary filtration to, to get down that. But overall, uh, for, for the small system, hardly there are any nutrients, like very stringent nutrient limits. It could be just like one total phosphorus and 12, 10 total nitrogen. Uh, they, that can be easily achieved within, within the uh, trace tract or oxidation ditch, uh, just with, with some modifications. Okay. Great, thank you. Um, this is a question that uh, may be an open question for the group. Uh, I'm going to put it to uh, Dr. Chauvin to start, um, but this is from Michelle at King County. Which solution is the most future-proof? Uh, in other words, most adaptable or flexible for future changes in flows, uh, best turndown ratios, or even ease of expansion that you can use to achieve what could be very stringent limits in the future? Um, so if you see like slowly we are going towards the intensification pretty much, uh, I, I would say like, first of all, achieving itself more stringent is, is hard uh, without using advanced uh, controls, without using uh, the new technologies. So I, I would say, uh, and again, the, the intensification technologies are becoming quite a bit reliable. Uh, same thing with the controls, they are getting pretty robust and reliable. So I would definitely say like going forward. Um, uh, and again, the other thing to add to this is, is very limited funding. Now, nowadays, if you see the funding available to expand, uh, most of the plants are landlocked. So I would say moving forward would be, would be intensification technologies with uh, with, with robust, reliable, uh, innovative controls. Thank you. Uh, I'll open it up to anybody else that might want to try to answer this. This is kind of an open question to the group, I believe. Well, yeah, I think I Raj, Raj has got an interesting, uh, you know, comment. And I think intensification is interesting if you have time to see whether or not you're able to actually intense, uh, intensify the process. You know, the dilemma there is if you're trying to do it at full capacity in a plant. Now, if you're fortunate enough to have a parallel reactor, 
that you could pursue developing the intensification process, you could see whether or not you can get there without having to capitalize things for the entire plant. I don't know what Raj thinks of that. Uh, I completely agree with that. Uh, I forgot, means like I should have mentioned, means moving forward, I'm saying like they do, each plant is unique. So moving forward, if they want to see, they do need to make sure it's good application for them, that it does work for them. And as you said, uh, not everyone is fortunate to have uh, 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 like a, a redundant basin that they can use for demonstration, but at least definitely they need to do a pilot and make sure that that is a good application for that. Yeah, but and not, the, not, everybody, not everybody's starting with activated sludge either. No, no, you know, no, I think I, any, I, I, I would to, just Rick, to, about, the, uh, to the question, you know, uh, anything that you can do that's modular that you don't have to capitalize at full scale and then you can preserve your options to use kind of an adaptive management approach to scale up and see whether or not you have preferences and how they perform with what you have and what you prefer. And you know that ties in a little bit to what Haley and I were talking about in terms of having enough time and compliance schedules to do that planning. And again, like if you see like, as, as we are moving forward, um, the time means like most of the, utilities are not proactive, they are reactive. So that's that's one perception if it changes that they become more proactive. Uh, and there are some utilities, uh, DC Water, HRSD, Clean Water Services, they, uh, King County, they, they are proactive. Boise City? What's that? Boise City? <laughs> not Boise, Boise, not Boise, King, King County I was talking. <clears throat> Uh, and Pima County. In, in, so they are pretty proactive. They have been looking at this for, for a long time and they, they are ready, I means they, they can easily get into the transition from, from the pilot demonstration to full scale. But again, that time or, or it's a perception of utilities. And again, when I was talking, I was talking with respect to moving forward in the future. So, but I agree. Uh, Dr. Lay, did you have something you wanted to add? Yeah, uh, I want to add that uh, I agree with uh, Dr. Shabang. Uh, in sense of intensification is for in term of a future proof in the sense that uh, looking to future to uh, keep the option open to implement some of the more um, maybe emerging, but starting to become a proven technology such as uh, those can allow you to improve the uh, performance to possibly intensify your capacity within the existing footprint. Uh, things uh, come to mind they include uh, the Animax uh, for side stream for sure, and uh, the technology to activate it in the mainstream has shown a pretty good process efficiency. Um, and uh, also some of the other technology that has promises such as the granular activated sludge, which comes a lot of times they have a close interaction with this uh, uh, mainstream uh, side stream, uh, mainstream uh, Animax process. So what I want to comment is, um, of course, every plant is different and the best solution for future proofing maybe coming, uh, comes with planning ahead for, uh, for sure. Uh, take uh, Washington as an example, as the ecology is moving towards nitrogen removal for uh, about the 70 uh, utilities that are discharged to the sound. Um, there will be a opportunity to optimize the nitrogen removal uh, first with minimum capital improvement to see how much you can improve the affluent nitrogen. And uh, this would provide a chance to revisit the long-term nitrogen removal strategy to see what you have selected is still in line with the keep the option out open. Uh, if, for example, mainstream Animax were uh, granular activated sludge, down 
and down the road in five or 10 years becomes uh, much more robust and, uh, and no longer requires uh, pilot testing in every plant. For, uh, for example, you want to make sure your future planning have the ability to adapt to that. Of course, if that's the FS or well, seem to fit your best, uh, there are ways to, in the planning, to keep the uh, bioreactor uh, upgrades kind of a tolerating of a multiple, um, multiple exact bio, uh, biological process selection um, allows the possibility for that to happen uh, in the future. We have used a similar uh, strategy for some of the plant in Australia, for example, when they really looking to, to optimize their process and to get most of their existing system. So um, our planning, so the key is to include the, the, the flexibility there to adapt for future. Okay, great. Um, I want to save time for some of the other questions because we, we do only have about five minutes left in the panel here. Um, a, a question um, it, actually to Dr. Lay again, um, kind of apropos given her answer to the last one, how does Animox differ from granular activated sludge? That's a very good question. Um, I assume you're talking about the mainstream. So the uh, the granular sludge in mainstream a lot of times are achieved by seeding the Animax granule to help the development uh, of the granule sludge that can be used in the suspended growth to uh, help achieve nitrogen removal and improve settability. But there are other type of uh, uh, granular sludge approach that uh, may not necessarily involve the mainstream uh, Animox uh, seeding. For example, in, uh, in the Nereida process, uh, the SBR is, <clears throat> is designed to, for, to have the right hydraulic scouring, the settling, and the aeration conditions. So granular sludge de develops that way. Uh, primarily utilizing the PAOs, right, and uh, other bacteria to form the structure, uh, but uh, Animax may not play a significant role there. Uh, so the granular sludge is, uh, in, my, um, in my mind, has a broader um, definition and uh, application. Okay, great. A uh, question for Adam Klein. Uh, if a facility is hit with a new total phosphorus limit and has to implement biological phosphorus removal, do they have to wait for struvite to become a problem to put in a struvite recovery system? Uh, if the mass balance shows they might have a problem right away. Yeah, I mean, that, that comes up a lot. A lot of plants that are shipped in to phosphorus removal get um, you know, proactive and uh, I know I've definitely worked at plants where maybe they had a little bit of struvite or just a tiny bit. And the question was, well, do we want to get it in front of it and you know, make this investment before we know it's a problem? Uh, so tools like this are helpful to try to kind of you know, get that going. I, I think it, it kind of comes down to where you are financially. If you're doing a big project to shift to BioP, uh, it probably does make sense to, uh, to go ahead and, and put that extra step in there, especially if it's going to benefit you you know, both for struvite and for your um, just carbon, you know, requirement for BioP. Okay, thanks. Um, another question for Dr. Lesnick. Uh, is, uh, is predictive analytics an approach that any size utility can do, or is it more of a leap for utilities to take this approach? And then what considerations do a utility need to take in order to start using the predictive analytics? So just to answer the, the first part of that is theoretically any facility could use some elements of this. The reason why we're, it's so good at CWS uh, is because they identified a sensor and a location that one could tell you downstream stability, um, but correlated nicely to that. So identif it's a process to 
get all the right data point, point pieces to develop forecasts as pretty as the ones I showed today. So that's a process as, you know, getting the data collection. Um, and then the, the, the second part, what was the second part of the question? Uh, the second part of the question is what considerations does a utility need to take in order to start using it? Well, as I briefly mentioned in the presentation, this is not just a, it's, you can't just build a model and then just let it be. I mean, this is the case for other models. There needs to be constant kind of maintenance of that. So to, to really get full use of this, these kind of tools, you're going to need to have a whole support data science support team behind that. Um, so if that's distributed through, you know, different engineering firms, consultancies, uh, maybe that's the, that's the future of these tools, but theoretically anybody could, could try to develop some, some tool to help, help with, with operations. Thanks. Uh, it looks like we are uh, out of time for questions. Uh, again, I want to thank everyone uh, for participating in this, uh, speakers and the audience. If you do have questions for our speakers, you can uh, email them directly. And uh, I'm sure they'd be happy to answer the, any questions that you have that, that uh, we weren't able to answer here today. Again, thanks, everyone. Thank you, Rick. Thanks, everyone. Thank you.